I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to The Conversation with Al McFarland. Uh, today is Wednesday, August 24th, 2022. I'm glad to be here and glad to be with you. Uh, I'm reflecting today still on yesterday's wonderful conversation. Uh, Brenda, Lyle Gray, and I uh, hung out with uh, uh, one of my cousins, Robert Powell, and uh, uh, several other arts luminaries from the Twin Cities. But it was a great conversation dealing with uh, the question of creativity, of art, the role, the power of art, of creativity, and the power of community. But it also dealt with uh, how we uh, are able to be with each other and grow as individuals. And Brenda, uh, good to see you, my friend. How are you doing today? I'm fine. How are you, Al? I am well. You know, I, I love going down memory lane and trying to recall how the world looked when we were five or six years old. And if someone is new joining us today, uh, I always enjoy saying that Brenda and I were kindergarten students together at D.A. Holmes uh, Kindergarten. Actually, we were supposed to be D.A. Holmes, but our school got burned down because they didn't want Blacks to come to it. Uh, so we had to do our first kindergarten year uh, in a dance hall a block away from Booker T. Washington Elementary School, I think. Uh, and they created this place where uh, it was upstairs, uh, it was a big ballroom. And I think by day, you know, kids were in the class sitting on the floor. And by night, they had the, the cabaret scene. As far as I can tell, I'm trying to remember if I rem remember alcohol or not. It might not have been attuned to oh, so be aware are. of the smell of alcohol at that time. <laughs> but that's kind of a, a, a great story to tell and a great experience looking back. Uh, and Brenda, you all have collected some, have some great pictures. And I wanted to have you uh, talk again about the ones that you've collected and shared in the past, starting with uh, our principal in grade school, uh, George Perry. Uh, tell me more about what you remember about uh, Mr. George Perry. That every day he walked in, he was neatly dressed. He spoke to every young person by their first name, but he also lived in our neighborhood. So he knew our parents. And um, one of the things that I so admired about him was literacy he wanted us to read. He didn't care what it was. We, we had to be reading and every day we had to learn five new vocabulary words. And we talked about careers in the fourth and fifth grade with our teachers. And it was just wonderful. And I think we're going back um, a lot on the shows now because we want to grab it and put it back today, maybe not the same, but the fact that education is so important. And um, he, he was just an exception to the rule and he had just high expectations, but so did our parents. And um, we had a spiritual foundation and that helped and we had uh, mentors um, in every block and we had block clubs and the homes were just meticulously um, groomed all of the time and especially during the holidays it was so beautiful in Santa Fe place so it was a special time and the pictures um, Al were combined uh, were uh, comprised by um, a group, uh, a council who put them all together. Alvin Brooks kind of headed up a whole lot of it. Mm -hmm. And um, it was called Moving to the Top of the Hill. And one of my first articles for you two years ago was Moving to the Top of the Hill and talking about that neighborhood. It was just special. And everyone talks about it. And listening to Robert yesterday, um, that that just meant an awful lot. And I can see Bernard's statue across the street standing. 
And let, me, let me give a background to those who okay. weren't here yesterday, but just to bring you up to what Brenda and I are reminiscing about. Yesterday's program included uh, an interview with Robert Powell, who's the founder of Portfolio Art and Education Center in St. Paul. It's an art gallery. Robert Powell himself is a sculptor of note, but uh, an entrepreneur who created a business to promote art and to develop and deliver education around and through the arts to the community. And he's been quite successful. He mentioned on the program that he uh, was mentored by his older brother, who is also a, uh, a, uh, an artist, a painter of national, international renown. Uh, the brother is Lonnie Powell. And to have a Lonnie Powell painting in your collection is to have a, a, a thing of value in your collection. His work is powerful, beautiful, uh, acclaimed, acknowledged, and uh, awesome. And so uh, we talked about the fact that we grew up together uh, in this neighborhood, Kansas City, across the street from what we called the Powell House. That's the house that his father owned that I grew up in. Uh, was a park that we used to go to every day, all of our you know kid lives. And uh, my one of our regulars on the Thursday edition of this program is uh, Dean Bermel, Burnell Powell. Uh, Burnell was twin brother to Bernard Powell. I always tell people that uh, my twin cousins were like six months older than me. And in my mind, we were triplets, uh, Bernard, Burnell, and Al. And because we were always together, I was always with them. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so Bernard was murdered when he was around 33 years old. He was active in community, active in business, active in organizing, active in politics, had won national awards. Uh, he was a recipient of the Jefferson Award, which is an award acknowledging civic engagement for young leaders, and had organized a campaign to run for Missouri State Senate. And in the course of that process, uh, one evening uh, going to a, a a late night uh, bar or club or something like that on 27th, I think, in what were 25th 27th or 27th? 27th in Indiana. In Indiana. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the people that he mentored who was angry, the story I have is that the young person was angry that Bernard would not let him be named manager of a new youth facility that they were opening in Kansas City uh, that was going to be named for Dick Gregory. Dick Gregory was part of, of their sphere of training and orientation. And uh, they were kind of uh, disciples of De Gregory among other leaders on the national scene. And uh, this person uh, either angered or put up to it by somebody else who knows, uh, ended up uh, unloading a, a, a 45 caliber bullet into Bernard's head point blank. And uh, it was a great loss for our community, for the family. Bernard lost his life. We say we, he gave his life. And one of the things we talked about yesterday was the fact that in the park across the street from the Powell House, at 28th in Brooklyn, that our community uh, remembered, established a memory, a permanent memory of Bernard by erecting a Bernard Powell Memorial statue and fountain. And we mentioned that it was my mother, uh, Maxine McFarland, who organized uh, community and fundraising and political approvals, et cetera, to have uh, that space designated to hose, to hold the Bernard Powell Memorial Fountain and Statue. And Robert mentioned that in the past year, the street that runs alongside uh, that park has been renamed in honor of my mother, uh, Maxine McFarland. So it's all family, and it's a rich family, an engaged family, engaged community, a community of families. And so we had that great conversation yesterday. But that, that led me to my George Perry story, Brenda. Uh, I just remember in, I think, sixth grade, we had visitors to our classroom from some kind of a state department activity and there were people who were Muslim and people who were Hindu, maybe three women were there. In our class, I'm sure they came to your class, yours was across 
the hall from my class mm -hmm. where we were, uh, some of us were assigned uh, stories to tell the presentations to make. And I was assigned to uh, deliver a, uh, a paper on the three major religions in, religions in the world. And so I did the research, with my encyclopedia world book, and came up with a paper on Judaism, uh, Hinduism, uh, and and uh, Christianity, those three. And it went well, but I was inspired because I got good feedback from, uh, from Dr. Perry. I got praise uh, for the good work I had done in creating the story and also the excellent presentation that I made. And that kind of encouragement means everything in the world. That's kind of why we believed, Brenda, that we could do anything and but look how far back that goes yeah and and what you remember that he said and your father about how you spoke at such a young age yep and look at what we remember those memories that has carried us for decades that's pretty powerful because robert came up with some things also and you know it, it it's it's a good thing Mm -hmm. You know, and especially if you have a bad day, you go back and you think about all of that laughter that we shared in that neighborhood. I mean, we played so hard that when we went to sleep, I don't think my mother could ever shake me because I was playing cowboys and Indians all day. We did. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I was going to ask Robert if he remembered. You might not remember because you weren't right in the exact neighborhood. But there was a, uh, what we call, we call them a gang today. But they weren't gangs like today's gangs. But the guys that were older than us on our block, 28th and Brooklyn, had an association that called themselves the Tennis Shoe Pimps. Tennis Shoe Pimps. I remember pimps. that one. Okay. And then <laughs> they had a war with the guys down on 29th Street. Uh, and that group called themselves the Dragnets. That's back when, uh, what's oh, his name, wow. Jack Webb, had the TV show called Dragnet. Yeah, love Everybody it. talked about it. So these guys down there were called the Dragnet. Uh, what's crowd. his name, Jack Friday or something like yeah, that? Friday yeah. and Jack Jack Webb or something like that, yeah, right? Yeah. And they had a, 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 a duke out or some kind of a battle out in the park, in the same park, with uh, homemade bows and arrows. And we made arrows out of uh, uh, reeds from or branches from bushes, and we take a bottle a bottle cap, and use a hammer or something a rock, and fold the bottle cap around the end of uh, a stem, and then notch the other end of it, and it made perfect arrows. So they wow. actually shoot each other. So a lot of memories, a lot of stories there. Wow. I think I think our friend uh, Cameron Perkhead is here. Uh, if he is, bring him in, and we'll we'll just continue to reminisce as we go. Uh, Cameron Perkett, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. How are you, sir? <laughs> doing good. Good to see you. Thank you for being here. Let me introduce you. Cameron Perkett is a U.S. bank mortgage retail branch manager. He's also president of NARAB, which is National Association, I think, of uh, Realty. Give me the full name. Uh, NARAB National Association of Real Estate Brokers. Brokers. Okay, I can't read it. Uh, so uh, you're here because we on Wednesdays spend time talking about wealth creation, and uh, uh, you know we know the mortgage is the principal tool for creating generational wealth in a family, and supporting education and supporting uh, wealth over generations. And our goal is to spend as much time as we can having conversations around wealth, around the value proposition, and giving people ideas, suggestions, tips, uh, and also crit critiquing uh, the institutions that have failed us so far in a way that also encourages them to simply course correct and uh, bring their best to our community because our community deserves uh, the best for itself. So for, with that, uh, welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you for what you do at U.S. Bank. Tell me about you, first of all, uh, and your role as a branch manager at uh, U.S. Bank Mortgage. Do, am I yes, saying that sir. very well? Is that correct? Am I describing that properly? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, hey, thank thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate the uh, the platform here, and certainly appreciate everything that you're doing to educate our community. Uh, as far as myself, again, my name is Cameron Burkett. I am a mortgage branch manager here for U.S. Bank, and also the president of NARAB Twin Cities. Uh, really, my my day to day job duties are are managing my loan officers, who are um, all diverse individuals. Have been given entry level opportunities to get into mortgage which is something that you don't see really anywhere else in the in the industry. And my job is really uh, mentorship and supporting their their pipelines with all the, the lovely families of color that they have buying homes, many of them first time home buyers. So uh, that's that's what I do. It's really a, a mentorship, a coaching and sales development role. So it's a, it's a great thing to come in and, and do every day and try to change the narrative of black home ownership here in the Twin Cities. Which branch are you at, um, brother? Yeah, so I'm not in the actual bank branch. I'm office out of Hopkins here, not a nice building, but my loan officers all across the cities. Uh, we got a loan officer over in North Minneapolis at the bank and off Broadway there. We've got one in East St. Paul off Burns. Uh, we've got West St. Paul. We've got uh, Bloomington. I mean, we're, we're all over the place. So what are the challenges and the opportunities for home ownership for black people in particular. Uh, take us down a review on where we have succeeded because Brenda and I grew up in families that owned homes. Uh, we lived in, I lived in a house that had three generations in it. Uh, the Powells, uh, Mr. Powell, uh, Robert and Burnell's dad was a, owned a barber shop, a restaurant and a pool hall on uh, the famed 18th Street in Kansas City. about the pool hall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, pool hall, dry cleaners, restaurant, and barbershop, all those things. Wow. And uh, then, uh, but bought this house on 28th Street back when 27th Street had been the border of the black community. So our family, one of the first families that moved across the line in what had been exclusive and redlined away from us. Brenda's family lived on 30th, further into uh, that area that, of change that we were a part of. But what is the story of housing for Black people in general, in your memory and in your mind? Where are we now? I think all the data I saw that said said that uh, what in the in the market crash about seven years ago, Black people lost a lot of houses and lost a substantial amount of wealth because of their loss of houses. So tell us about the whole picture. You're, you're exactly you're exactly right, unfortunately. So uh, we, we have not, in, in my humble opinion, made significant progress since the crash where actually black uh, housing in the Twin Cities is projected to decrease actually nationwide as well. Um, as most people know here in, in our community, we have the lowest black home ownership rate in the country, which is unacceptable. Uh, why that is, we, we have a long history. We've got the racial covenants. We've got um, uh, what I would call passive, passive aggressive racism. We're, we're all familiar with that up here in the state of Minnesota. So right now at this time, we, we have not made significant progress as far as the numbers and the data goes with actually increasing black home ownership. The, the hope right now and, and the momentum that we're seeing after George Floyd's murder has really brought a lot more resources and a lot more power to the table to make positive changes. So I'm, I'm hopeful we'll see uh, some increases in this data moving forward, but um, I'm, I'm not gonna come on here and sugarcoat it. And in my time being in the business, we've been quoting the, the same number when it comes to black home ownership and kind of asking the question of why and, and how do we make this change? So again, hopefully the, the influx of, of resources and people in power that are actually taking this seriously now and understanding this is a problem and willing to do something that should help us move the needle here in the very near future. We got a lot of great people out here doing the work. We just haven't seen measurable progress that we would expect since the crash. You know, I think it's smart for us to remind ourselves and the world that the problems that we're experiencing are not, not uh, one dimensional. Uh, yes, there are structural uh, barriers and and challenges, but sometimes because of that, we've internalized some of the um, things that keep us from pursuing 
even our own best interest. Sometimes we don't have the knowledge, you know. So t talk about what you see as both challenge and opportunity presently. You've kind of laid the, the, the foundation for that. But you know, if we address structural external uh, problems, what does that mean and what do we need to do? And, you know, then what do we need to identify as personal internal cultural challenges that also have a negative impact on our ability to create wealth to be homeowners what do you think right exactly and I, i'm so happy that you you brought that up because there is two parts right so there's what we call leveling the playing field to a certain extent mm -hmm. but then on the other side we always like to say if the level if the playing field is level we still have to know how to play the game we have yeah. to be good players right we have to be educated so uh the positive though when when we look at opportunity uh, especially being with an organization like NARAB and working with the local nonprofits and seeing so many different educational events that are going out there we have young black folks that are hungry for this knowledge and coming out and educating themselves and not only wanting but expecting to own a home in the near future so that's the the silver lining where I feel like uh, this, not to say that, you know, the, the OGs didn't have the same desire, but I feel like this young generation, you know, my age and younger, they have kind of a different perspective where some of those traditional barriers that we've had on ourselves are starting to crumble. And, and some of the things that we could continue to get better at is removing the fear of hearing no, specifically when we want to get into home ownership, we want to go sit down with a, a mortgage professional, we can't have that that internal barrier, that wall of, I'm scared to hear no, I'm expecting them to tell me no, it's not made for me. You have to go in and figure out if it is a no, why is it a no? And how do I turn this into a yes? Understanding that process and, and really taking that ownership to improve yourself. So again, as a playing field level today, not quite, but we still have to take that responsibility and learn how to play the game. And I, I have to tell you with, with the nonprofits we have out here, the organizations like NARAB and, and similar, there's no shortage of resources for, for people to learn and educate themselves and be financially ready, not only for home ownership, but really anything in life. Part of that we've heard from colleagues of yours, I think uh, Brother uh, Rucker was on a couple of weeks ago, and also Trent Bowman has been on recently. You know Trent, I'm sure. But I think Trent or Absolutely. Rucker, both of them would say, part of the challenge is to educate our own people to understand yep. that a no is simply a, a slow yes. A slow yes. A That's slow right. yes, you know? So if you get a no, don't get whacked. Don't get bent on the shape. Take it for what it is. It's a slow yes. You got some work to do, but you can do the work and you can get the result you want, but you have to focus. And I think you hit the nail on the head, brother, that too often our people have allowed ourselves to be conditioned to be almost fatalistic about what was going to be inevitably a rejection by bankers in general, you know, white people in general. I've heard this, and you can speak to it as well, that a difference between a, a white family going to buy a home or make a car purchase and a black family is that a black family goes to, uh, uh, you know, a, a mortgage lender, a broker, a bank, and they say they get approved, but it's at a fairly high interest rate. They're so happy to get approved because they were so fearful, you use the word fear, that they were gonna be rejected, that they accept that offer and they run home uh, saying, let me get out of here before the banker changes his mind and I lose my opportunity to buy a house. White family, on the other hand, says, that's your offer? And Banker says, yes, well, I'll get back to you. And the white family will go to three, four, five more bankers and shop. You know, and in shopping, uh, he or she is able to get the best, certainly a better deal. And we have not trained ourselves to approach major purchases or conditions. We've been instead sort of uh, uh, um, trained or, or um, indoctrinated, oriented, to feeling not worthy, not worth that we were depending on luck and not on our solid financial awareness, knowledge, planning, and our worth. Uh, and so these other things were barriers. So 
uh, I think that speaks to what you're talking about. I'm going to let you talk more about it because you would know from the inside, uh, you know, the truth of that statement or any variations on it. Yeah, so we, we did see that traditionally. Again, I'll, I'll salute the younger generation and all the, the information that's available now. I feel like that barrier is coming down because you can go on the internet and, and find the answer and find different professionals to compare options. But yes, we do still see that a lot where we're expecting to hear no, we get that yes, and we don't question it. We just want to run with it. Like you said before, you know, they change their mind. And we have to, this is again, having that financial literacy, understanding how the mortgage process works, how credit works, how we view income, how the different products that are available out there. And you can learn these things and in most cases for free by sitting down with somebody like me, by sitting down and, and going over to see Henry Rucker at PPL and doing individual uh, home ownership counseling, going to a home stretch course where you have individuals like Henry and, and Trent and a lot of a lot of the good soldiers out here telling you firsthand experience how to how to maneuver and put yourself in a successful position and getting out of the mindset of minimum requirements that's that's another thing you know the the wrong question to ask is what's the minimum credit score the right question to ask is what credit score is going to put me in the best position what down payment is going to put me in the best position why ask those questions and understand the difference between the products and if you're working with a, a professional that can't do that or is unwilling to do that, that's where you reach out to a, a group like NARAP, you, you reach out to a PPL, you reach out to a, a Build Wealth, a Model Cities, and, and you'll get those answers. So again, learning to play the game is everything, not just accepting any random product, not being just pushed into an FHA product, not just being taking down payment assistance because you heard this program is giving this money and it's free money, understanding that there's, there's positives and negatives to most financial decisions we make and being able to have that, that game plan to say, okay, I'm doing it for this reason and here, here's the end result I'm looking for in home ownership. And I, I think we, you, you hit it on the head. I can't say anything more about it. We have to understand the process and the resources. I'm gonna to continue to say this, the knowledge is available. It's not, it's not a secret for us anymore. It's, it's out in the public, it's available. If, if you're pursuing that, connect with me, connect with NARAB, PPL. We, we have, that. that's the, the one surprising thing to me in our market, especially after going to other markets like Milwaukee and, and a few different places. The, the way that our nonprofits and the people that are doing equity work and housing are connected here in the Twin Cities is, is unique compared to other markets. So it, it's crazy that we have the stats we do and as professionals, maybe we need to do a better job of getting the word out there and saying, hey, this is where you need to be and why. But, you know, as black consumers, we need to take that ownership and pursue that knowledge as well. You've mentioned a number of organizations that I know and recognize as excellent nonprofits. But, you know, this is a good chance uh, to let you kind of walk us through those. Uh, how do you advise people? How do you as a banker, mortgage lender, direct someone maybe to PPL or to um, uh, NARAB or to uh, Build Wealth Minnesota. So take a minute uh, to the degree that you're comfortable explaining what these organizations are, what they do, how people can use them, and why should you choose this one versus that one, or should you use both? Uh, you know, what, what, let's take a minute to educate uh, our viewers and listeners right now. Uh, and, and draw the distinction between your role as a banker and those resources, how you work together, but how you also compete. Uh, absolutely. So the, the difference between what, what I do as a mortgage lender, um, I'm really looking at your financial situation as it is today and matching your goals, let's say in this case for home ownership, with products that actually fit your financial situation, something that you qualify for. What, what we don't do is, is credit repair, credit counseling. We're certainly gonna be educators to a certain extent, but not to the level that, that you're gonna need if you're somebody that's not familiar, you're not financially savvy, you're starting from scratch with credit. So in a, in a nonprofit sense, when we're talking about the PPLs, the model cities, these folks do a lot of things outside of housing and down payment assistance and, and whatnot, but our interaction so is- what's, what's PPL? And what's model city so people can know yep, what so, they are yep so project for pride and living is a local nonprofit. 
uh, our relationship on the NARAB side and my side on the bank is in the housing. They sp specifically have high numbers of, uh, of black families that are participants in their program. And it could be a number of different things. You could sit down and get one-on-one -on -one counseling to talk about budgeting, improving your credit, establishing credit. And then you can also get your home buyer education that's required for a lot of first time buyer programs. So that's usually gonna be in the form of an eight hour in-person class taught by local professionals to teach you the basics of home ownership and sustaining that home. And even better, you can get connected with real estate professionals, mortgage lenders. So in a perfect world, what, what we wanna see is a first time buyer is, is going through the educational process with one of the nonprofit partners so they understand what you know down payment means, what an escrow account is, how their credit's gonna impact rates. Maybe a little bit about different programs that are out there and then they're connecting with the lender when they have some knowledge about their financial situation. What we see today is the opposite where we have families connecting with the real estate agent wanting to see homes without looking at their financial picture, without understanding what's realistic for them, or they're coming to the mortgage lender's office and they're just hearing about their credit for the first time and maybe it's a collection account they didn't know they had. That's that's what we're seeing now. And in some cases, folks can can sneak through in that way, but um, up here in Minnesota for black families, clearly that's not working. So we need to change that process and make sure we're getting our education first, understanding what we're getting into and making a decision if one, is home ownership right for you right now? We talk about home ownership all the time, like it's, it's a one size fits all. Everybody's life situation is, is not suitable for home ownership. There's nothing wrong with that, but you have to take that time to educate yourself and make that decision. And then when you get to my desk, we're having an easier conversation. We're speaking the same language and looking at ways to get you into that, that dream home or that investment property, whatever it may be that you're looking for. So we just got to do a, a better job of not putting the, the cart before the horse. We need to learn about our finances, learn about mortgage, learn about real estate, sustainable home ownership, and then go and find the programs from the lender that are gonna get us to that destination. You use the word suitable, and uh, I'm particularly sensitive to words and their meaning and nuance. And w what do you mean by that? And I tell you, I'm raising the question because it seems there's a value associated with it. Maybe suitable isn't the right word, but maybe it's exactly the right word. Uh, uh, I'm trying to examine my own feelings about it right now as we're speaking. And to me, there's a judgment of somebody being suitable or not suitable with that judgment being external to the person versus internal. And I think what uh, I would like a lender or advisor to say is uh, not to advise me whether I'm suitable or eligible or or capable, but uh, to give me both guidance and support in understanding what my priority and my possibilities can be. It's like you said, when you go to a situation asking what's the minimum score and what's the minimum down payment, that's the wrong way to approach you know, the room. The proper way to right. approach it is to walk in and say, uh, you know, I think I forgot exactly what you said, but I understood the feeling of what you said. There's another way of looking at it that doesn't lead with the deficit. So I'm just I'm just kicking it here. Uh, work with me. Tell me what I, you know, how you react to what I'm saying. Yep. So you, you hit it on the head. So two different things. So you could say suitable or qualifying on, on that end. That's completely different than what I was referring to, where mm -hmm. is it is it right for me? Is it suitable for my lifestyle and what mm -hmm. I have going on? And I'll give an example. Just because I qualify to purchase a $350,000 home, maybe my debt to income is extremely high and I have very little room for error on a monthly basis. Maybe I have a, a job that my income's gonna fluctuate. It's been a good you know, 18 months, but I'm not sure if it's gonna be as good for the foreseeable future. Those are questions you have to ask mm -hmm. instead of just saying, okay, I get this letter, that means it's right for me. It might not be. Maybe, maybe now it's not the right time to buy a home for many different reasons. Maybe you're relocating. Again, your income might be uncertain. 
you're uncomfortable with the housing payment. You know, we want to set people up for long-term success in home ownership. And that's where the consultative approach comes in when you're working with a professional as you have to decide for yourself what is success in home ownership, right? How much, how much, you know, spare money do you need? How do you feel about repairs? How, how are you planning for the long run on this? Not just getting this letter and running out and, you know, letting a real estate agent or a lender push in and doing something that's really not right for you. So two different things. You could qualify for anything, but that doesn't mean that it's, it's right for you at that time. And that's where education comes in and having somebody that you can trust to give you, uh, you know, the, sometimes the bitter truth or the hard truth, uh, which, which may not be exactly what you want to hear at the, at the, at the time. Uh, Mention, and we're here because of the relationship we have with Build Wealth Minnesota. Uh, David McGee and his team over there have created a wonderful initiative that involves you, uh, the banking community, the nonprofits, all together in trying to create, to ideate uh, a public awareness around home ownership and wealth creation. The initiative is called 9,000 Equities, but take a minute to talk about uh, build wealth Minnesota, what they do, how you interact with them. Yeah. So, so build wealth is really a a staple in Minneapolis when it comes to really anything, when it comes to wealth generation for black families. So, you know, Dave and the, David and the crew, they've been doing it a lot longer than I have. And, um, it, it just was a connection that made sense, especially taking over as president for NARAB. That was a connection that we had to strengthen. A lot of us work together you know, kind of behind the scenes, but making it more of a, a public unified movement and being a part of that 9,000 equities and really bringing all our resources together to say, hey, we've all been doing, you know, this equity work to some extent in our different areas. Let's all come together under one brand and make this happen. So um, that, that 9,000 equities is, is taken off. It's got a lot of support. It's got all the right people behind it. And and my personal, my personal uh, vision for it would be that uh, black families could see that logo and say, okay, anybody affiliated with that, they get it. They have my best interest in mind. This is somebody that I can trust to get uh, a good opinion on or guidance or, you know, figure out anything that that's related to successful home ownership. So um, it's a great movement. As far as build wealth goes, obviously they do more than just 9,000 equities. They do, you know, your education, they do the family stabilization, which is uh, a unique version of education. A lot of the stuff you get out here is just focused on, you know, credit and, and mortgage and buying a home where they can actually teach you how to uh, how to increase and, and stabilize your home, which is something that we need in our community just as much as anything. Especially, you know, we, we've got um, we, we really have kind of what I call the, the disappearance of, of the black man in, in our community. And we just talked about this last weekend at the equities meeting and trying to figure out like what's, what's, how can we put our households back together? And, you know, not that there's anything wrong with, with our, our strong ladies leading the way, but at some point we got to, you know, look at ourselves and figure out why are we falling behind as men? So there, there's a lot going on over there. Um, Big, biggest thing that I wanted to mention about 9,000 equities was the shift from the traditional mindset of mm-hmm. buying a just an owner occupied single family home, which in a small way is an investment because you're building equity. You got that stability, you got that freedom, but they're kind of leading the way and saying, hey, why can't, why can't our people as first time home buyers buy multifamily properties mm-hmm. and not only have equity to build, but have residual income, become a property investor and kind of speed that process up. Now you're not looking at so much of a payment. Now you have tax benefits by having rental income, just changing that mindset from, you know, not just the traditional way, but let's look at owning homes and building wealth at the same time. Let's speed that up. And uh, there's some good programs out there for that. I think I was at a, or perhaps moderating a NARAB event, maybe a year or two ago, two years ago, before the pandemic. And uh, it was the second time that I remember uh, this one young guy, white guy, who talked about, I'm not sure which bank he was with, but talked about uh, going from renting to purchasing his own first home. He wasn't married at the time, but planned to get married, but he 
did the numbers, you know, saw what his situation was and what he envisioned it might be in a year or two or five. And uh, uh, he and his uh, significant other uh, decided that they uh, could uh, buy a multi-unit property. And, and they didn't use these terms, but it meant like living with reduced rent of your own and having tenants uh, pay your mortgage and also create wealth, help you create wealth. And so just to have that, that conversation as a young person thinking strategically, I think is important. And that's the value, one of the values that you all can bring to teaching young people about why they should be homeowners. Let, let me ask you, uh, Cameron, your personal story. Tell me about you. Uh, are you from Twin Cities or uh, how long you been here and how long you been in, in the in the uh, banking business? Yes, sir. I am. I'm born and raised in East St. Paul. So I've been here my, my whole life. Don't plan on ever running away. I might might become a snowbird one day. Um, you know, really, I, I grew up in a single parent household. So it's just mom and my younger brother. Uh, you know, we weren't an affluent family by any means. You know, mom woke up and grinded all day, every day, which is where I kind of got my work ethic from. And um, you know, to this day, I feel like um, I, I have such a passion in doing equity work in real estate because I, I come from a background that we didn't have those conversations. You know, my mom wasn't a homeowner. We never talked about saving money. We never talked about credit. I had to find that out when I was a grown man going out in the world and figuring out, oh, this is how this works. Oh, these loans I'm taking to go to school, I got to pay these back and mm -hmm. I probably could have found a, a better loan. So. Uh, that's kind of drove my, my passion to get into anything financial. Originally, I wanted to be a financial advisor. Uh, the barriers at that time, the barriers to entry were significant. You know, you're talking about an all commission job, having to get a license on top of having to know people that have money to invest with you, mm -hmm. which is a, a whole different problem. Um, got into banking, you know, really, I'll, I'll keep it real. I got into some trouble after high school. I was not allowed to get into banking. So when that cleared up and I had that opportunity, I was hungry. I started with doing uh, auto loans for a large bank. That's where I really learned credit. I learned finance. I honed in my sales skills, my networking skills. And then that just transitioned into mortgage at the time. It was kind of the next step up and uh, did that in the call center, mastered mortgage. And then I got into retail and started doing kind of the NARAB thing and being actually in the community, working with local folks instead of working just nationwide and it, it's just stuck and I'm blessed now to be in a leadership opportunity and the, the game is is so much so much different than it was when I first got in where you had to know somebody to know somebody or you had to have numbers you had to have pr production stats to get in and we're starting to see a shift now where young people of color are getting that opportunity if they have the right mentality they have the right drive and moving away from what's on your resume and you know what what's on your W-2 from your production last year. So hopefully that that trend can can continue. And, you know, I'm, I'm honored to be at the forefront of that here in, in the Twin Cities. How many generations back in Twin Cities do you go? Uh, how, how far back does your family memory go for you? Not not too far, honestly. So my, my mom growing up was from Milwaukee and came over here during the uh, the Prince and, you know, Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis days at a young age, about 17. So, you know, I'm the, I guess I would say the, the first full generation that's been here in Minnesota. And now I've got children of my own and we'll just keep, keep that rolling. Do you know about your uh, way back ancestors at all or not? No, sir. I do not. I do not. Okay. okay. Right. I do not. Uh, I'm into that myself so a I, lot. I, I ask people all the time, but it's kind of where my head is, you know. Yeah, you know, honestly, it, it's something I need to look into, but it's going to be more of the the research route, just because both both sides of my families are are broken families, so it's not it's not as simple as picking up the phone and saying, you know, hey, bring me back. There's there's missing pieces, right? There's there's um, absent fathers after absent fathers, and you lose a little bit of that history. So mm -hmm. I, that's you know something I'm going to have to do the the genetic way and put more effort into it, but. Right now, this this work is what's consuming me. 
Well, it, it seems to me it's the right thing. I mean, just listening to you and uh, sort of uh, giving props to you because uh, what you're doing is planting the seeds, laying the pathway for restorative healing in our community. I think that uh, as I listen to you, brother, uh, I feel and sense a, uh, a joy that you have in setting people on the right path, on, on a path to personal and family, you know, comfort, not, not just comfort, but fulfillment to understanding that uh, being accountable is not impossible. It's doable. Right. <laughs> and, right. and that once you ad adopt a mindset of accountability to yourself and to your uh, ideas and ideals and to some values, uh, that then uh, the sky becomes the limit. You can do a lot of things and do them in a way that's public, transparent, legal, appropriate, and beneficial to each and every person uh, involved in that process. Am I saying the right thing? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to bring it, bring it to the, you know, the business world, the real estate world, that's what I love so much about the organization of NARAB, where I view it, I think of it from like a, a father angle. We always say, hey, I want my, my children to have a platform to have a little bit more, if not a lot more than what I had when I came in. And we see that the same way as professionals, specifically when we're talking about black professionals saying, hey, some of us have, have you know, a good lifestyle. Some have higher levels of, of success than others. But when we see that young professional of color come in, we want to we want to do our small role to make it that much easier, that little, little, little bit easier for them to have success and, you know, change their family's narrative. And that's that's what's going to create change. And make things look different here when it comes to black home ownership. So again, the numbers aren't there, but I could tell you there's there's a lot of momentum. We've got all the talent in the world. We got young folks that are, are coming into the business understanding, hey, I can be successful. I can do this because I actually could see a few examples around of people who are at where I'm at. And that's, that's what this is all about. And so um, on a global level, do you see uh, a, um, a sea change, a system-wide change. It seems to me that we were operating in a hostile environment whose structure was created in part to manage and dampen and marginalize our expectations uh, to keep us living, in a sense, at the margin, uh, to not know and enjoy uh, the possibility of unfettered prosperity and, uh, you know, fully uh realized uh living uh always you know one foot in one foot out right uh is how i think our community uh was uh forced to deal with in this culture in in this country in the west all as a consequence of uh, uh the transatlantic slave trade our uh, historical uh interaction with uh colonists and colonial powers and imperial powers all of that still stays with us, but the question is how we focus on our own capability, our own resilience, and our own commitment to uh, transcending those barriers and, in fact, becoming improved uh, because we discovered pathways to realization despite the obstacles. And so what do you see? I, you several times talked about young people, and I love hearing you say that, uh, that they're, you're saying, a, a real uh, uh, distinct uh, difference in awareness and confidence in young people. Talk about that some more. Absolutely. We, we just have, I, I just speak from personal experience with my professional interactions. I, I meet with a lot of uh, young potential <laughs> first time home buyers. Um, I've been, I've had the pleasure of, of going back to my old high school and talking to kids and some of these kids they could already tell you, you know, how many bedrooms they want in their first home. Some of them wanted duplexes. Some of them wanted this size garage. Those are things when, when I think of myself being in high school, mm -hmm. I wasn't worried about owning a home. I was just trying to trying to get by and get out of that school day and, you know, go get into trouble somewhere. So the mentality is different, and and maybe it, it's a it's a testament to the parents that raised us. I'm sure again the internet and the 
kind of the freedom of information has an impact on it as well. I just don't feel like this this next generation gets enough credit. A lot of times we hear the flip side of, oh, back in the day, they, they would have never made it or they're not as tough and things like that. Maybe that's true, but the one thing that they have is they're they're coming out smarter, younger. And and I can say that from the front lines. And you can just look at the the professionals. So let's look at real estate agents. There's a million real estate agents in the Twin Cities. Look at the youth that's in this game right now. There are a lot of young, successful real estate agents that are up and coming. We're a little behind and on mortgage with that, but it's on the way. So I just feel like the the mindset is different. We've just moved another generation further from that, that um, I'll just keep it real, from that slave mentality. We've moved one step further from that. And uh, that's that's promising. That's very promising. Listen, uh, Brenda, any questions or comments? Uh, we've got about five minutes to go to wrap this I'm program up, but I've been, I'm enjoying this conversation. Uh, brother, I'm impressed. And I thank you for uh, being here and for what you're doing and what you're saying. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Cameron, you're talking about the young folks, but even seniors can step out and try to get a home. But um, I thought it was interesting because Trent and uh, Mr. Rucker talked about telling a story when you talk to a banker or talk to a real estate person that it is about and I think you said it, it's why you want to go into a home, whether it's very young or whether it's 75 years old. Correct. But because of Trent, I decided I was going to walk into my bank and I was going to tell my story. I've been going through a lot um, where I'm, I've been living for three years and I said I couldn't do it anymore. And so I was going to tell my story. Immediately, I mean, I had been with the bank for 15 years, so that helped. Um, but immediately, they looked at my credit score, which surprised me, um, and then put me into a program called HomeWise. I haven't found out yet whether I qualified for the program, but it was directed toward women because we are the least of, um, you know, buying homes. So I, I just want women to know it's not too late and it is possible. Um, but I also remember as an educator, Cameron, of having financial literacy in the fifth and sixth grade and also dressing up and going to the first black bank with my savings book and knowing about, you know, saving money and being proud that we had that much in the bank. So um, right. we, we got a ways to go. Right, right. But and, and that's interesting. Step. And you and you are very impressive to be as young as you are and, you know, had, you know, a hiccup and got rid of the hiccup and moved on. And a lot of people wouldn't have done that. It was it would be like, oh no, I, I I can't overcome. And look at where you are now. So congratulate you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and I, I just that's one of the main reasons why I do this, and I like to share my story, uh, specifically not to not to pick on the young folks again, but let them know like, hey, life happens. Your things Tell might happen that it. you never planned. <laughs> but you can absolutely 110% pursue your dreams and be a successful contributing member of society and, ma and make your, your soul happy, take care of your children, build your family legacy, and you know just be kind and give back to others. And that's, that's what I try to do every day. And Al talks about it all the time. The key that they have is technology. And absolutely. You know, the others are light years ahead of us because they even tried to hold that back. But right. that's the key. That is the exactly. key, because everything is there. Let me throw a wrinkle in here. Uh, not a real wrinkle, but it's another uh, thing that I believe is praiseworthy. I don't know how old you are, but I speak highly, uh, Brother Cameron, of the hip-hop generation. 
Now, you might be in that or just after it or just before it. I'm not sure which, but I marvel at the hustle, uh, this attitude that I don't need to have somebody else outside judging me that I can organize in my own community, in my own space, in my own mind, uh, ways to uh, create a world that supports uh, and that values me. I'm not having to go to somebody else's altar to genuflect or to kiss somebody else's ring, right? Uh, when I can just find people like me that I know, that I grew up with, whose story I know, and who's and who know my story. And together, we can do anything that can be done. What other people have done, we can do. We simply need to decide to do it. And I think the hip hop movement has demonstrated the truth of that because the entire world is following that model right now. And that model comes out of the community, not out of the university. Uh, what do you think right. about that? And what does that mean for that generation of young people that you're talking about? Yep. so that, that's the sauce that I'm referring to. And I'm definitely familiar with the hip hop movement. I will give my age out there because, you know, I'm old now. I'm 33. <laughs> So, you know, uh, I've been around a couple, two laps, maybe two and a half laps. Um, but that, that's what I mean, where that that ability and, and I like the analogy of using the, the music business where traditionally you'd have to, you know, have talent, get noticed. And then you'd have to go to the man and get funded and, you know, get the CDs created and you'd have your little your little budget and take the back end where now we're saying, hey, if we can go directly to the people who are from where I'm from and are going to feel exactly what I'm feeling are going to relate to me. And I don't need to follow those, those guidelines or go through those barriers. We can create our own lane and we need to apply that same concept to real estate in the twin cities and nationwide. That's, that's exactly what I mean, where technology has, has given them that edge where if you didn't have the internet, that would be impossible. Nobody could hear your voice. Nobody could access your content. And that's we can do that same thing when it comes to financial literacy, when it comes to a group of people saying, hey, we all got a few thousand dollars. Let's throw this in and, and buy something. Let's go buy some land. Let's start a business, whatever yeah, it is. And, and people are connected. Right. People are as much as, you know, we always and, and I'm, I'm kind of from that age where I remember before everybody had a cell phone. I remember landlines and all that type of stuff. And you had to have a phone book. I remember those times. And yep. There was there is a beauty to that that natural connection, but there's also a beauty to how technology has made this possible. Like what we're doing, I can reach out to somebody anywhere in the world. We can connect and come together and and do something great. And that's that's what I mean. Where they're just they're armed to really change the narrative because they don't have the restraints that we had growing up. And I'll, I'll use another example, like all this cryptocurrency, it's the same concept where we're starting to create things that can't necessarily be controlled and allow people to say, no, nah, this ain't for you. Maybe mm -hmm. maybe another day, but not today. Mm -hmm. And you're saying our people are getting into it, you're saying? Absolutely. I'd love to have you come back and maybe help me come up with, because I'm, I'm a Neanderthal when it comes to, was it NFTs? Is that the, the mix, the new word is NFTs and, and yeah. cryptocurrencies. I don't know what that is. And so at some point in time, I'm going to reach out to you and maybe you help me put together a panel that has a discussion about what these tools and what these strategies are, because uh, that's in, in part the way of the future. Well, listen, Brother Cameron, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for what you do at uh, U.S. Bank here. Uh, the president also of Twin Cities, NARAB, National Association of Real Estate Brokers. Thank you for that work, that leadership, and um, uh, such a pleasure to talk with you today. Nice Absolutely. meeting you, Cameron, and the best of luck. Thank you so much for having me. I'll see you all soon. And I'll reach out to you, and we'll put uh, uh, step two together, okay? Yes, sir. All right, take care. I'm Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.